parents focus so much at these kids' games on the wins and losses, yelling at the refs and things like that, rather than teaching life lessons to their kids, rather than focusing on effort. All they care about, oh yeah, my kid, you know, won, scored this many touchdowns. But like that to me is like, as a parent, I want to be somebody who doesn't focus on external like wins and losses. It's more about, hey, at the end of the day, doors closed, you're in your bed at night. Like, can you say you played your hardest or you, you were a good teammate? Just whatever that is. I think that's way more important. And on that Biggest Loser, I tried telling that process. Whether it's fitness journey, whether it's parenthood, it's like this idea of like, you gotta enjoy this this process. If you just enjoy the outcome, you're gonna be let down constantly. Oh boy, today's episode, we interview Steve Cook. Now this is the guy that pretty much was the first fitness influencer. He kind of created the space. He's one of the first people out there to build an account and get followers because they were fit and because of the fitness information they gave. More recently, he was one of the hosts on the Biggest Loser TV show. And this guy's actually a great guy. He actually knows what he's talking about. Unlike most fitness influencers, he knows what he's talking about. So in today's episode, we interview him, talk about a story, what it was like being one of the first fitness influencers out there, paving the way, what it was like being a host on The Biggest Loser, and what his goals are for the future. Now this episode, oh, by the way, you can find Steve Cook on Instagram. Okay, he's got a huge following. So it's at Steve Cook. And that's on Instagram. And you can also go to his website, fitnessculture.com. Also, today's giveaway, uh, the RGB bundle. Get that for free, but you got to win. Here's how you enter. Leave a comment below this video, the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you do all those things and if you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. Also, one more thing. These are the final hours for the May MAPS program sale. Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, and the Prime Bundle, all 50% off. If you want to take advantage of this before the sale ends, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code MAY50, or just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Steve, I want to go, you're, you're like the original, uh, I want to, I would, I would say you're like one of the first, like, uh, I guess real influencers in the space. Like you, you were kind of the dude on <laughs> you YouTube. You like that term, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Before I, I'm sorry. I no, bad. no, it's Oh, fine. bro, we hated his bad, so it's <laughs> yeah, all good. I mean, you kind of wrote the blueprint, I, I would say, like one of the first people to really do it that way. I want to go way back, dude. I want way to know back. how this started, like who who you are, where you grew up, and yeah. let's let's walk through the timeline. I'll preface it with probably this. it was just being in the right place at the right time. Okay. But yeah, we could do that for sure. Yeah, right? yeah. Let's go back. Let's start. Like, okay, where'd you grow up? Let's talk a little bit about that yeah. and, and how you got into fitness, and then how this all turned into this media. Thing. Yeah. It, well, I grew up in Boise, Idaho, so kind of kind of smaller community. My dad, like big family. So I have about six, six in my family that I grew up with and then some stepbrothers and sisters. Wait, six, six kids? Six siblings, yeah. Oh, oh shit, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, big family. Um, Where you fall in the group? I'm kind of right in the middle. Okay. So yeah, I have, I had a stepbrother who's younger. I have a half brother who's younger and a younger sister. And then I have uh, basically, well, actually, when you start including step in there, it's like Eight kids. Wow. Okay, so guys, I'm losing track here. How many were actually in the house still growing up? In the house, there was about five. Okay. My my sister, she was older, so she was kind of she was kind of out by the time I was, you know, teenager. And she actually lived with my grandparents for a while. But yeah, five to six, depending at the time. And I kind of was I had two younger than me. So Okay. Wow. So okay, so Mormon? Do you guys grow up Mormon? No, well, see, my parents were divorced when I was super young. My mom's side and my mom, LDS, they were Mormon. And then my dad, he grew up Catholic, like New Jersey. And so we were raised, I lived with my dad and we, my stepmom, we were just raised kind of non-denominational Christian, but always kind of had our, a good, you know, idea of what, you know, Mormonism was about and things like that. Cause my whole side of the family was, my older brothers and sisters were actually like baptized and then mm. taken off the records and stuff. Like never really talked about the religion stuff, but yeah, so they, we grew up pretty religious, but big family. Dad was an athletic director, high school basketball coach. So it was like, we were just always activities mm. His, were you good rebellious what were you i was the shit like uh, i was I, good or bad was bad yeah, oh, no, no, no i was okay. i was a little shit okay. not, not shit. the shit i was a little shit no so I, I kind of was just one of those kids that always asked why like you know like don't do that why like always jumping out, out off of things i can remember like if something was high as a kid i just wanted to jump off of it for whatever reason just probably my fear of heights i felt like i needed to conquer it but like i was just like my dad because it was i was my stepmom I was kind of a troublemaker, you know, I just had a lot of energy. My dad kind of took him everywhere, like anywhere, anytime he had a basketball practice or, you know, he was an athletic director. So it was always sports events. I would go with him. This is as a kid. 
And that's kind of where I actually got introduced to the gym because he was at a high school, good old Bora High School in Boise, Idaho. And they just had this like dark dungeon gym downstairs. And so like at yeah. 12, 13, like we would go to the track and then he'd also make me kind of work out. None of my older brothers and sisters like liked exercise really. Like we all did like track stuff, but none of them liked lifting weights. But my dad was like, you want to watch TV? 50 pushups. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like commercial breaks, 50 pushups constantly. But I kind of, I just kind of took to it too. It was like one of those things that as like, like a little kid, I liked being that, that strong kid. So, oh, wow. and it, so it, you responded pretty well to it. Yeah. It was, it was just, I think in sixth grade I had like, you know, I was, I think I benched like 220 in sixth what? grade. No, yeah, no way. It, yeah. It was Shut stupid. Your face. So I started doing pushups as, as this little kid. I think at, at, at one point in time, it was a national record. I don't know if it is or it isn't anymore, but wow, that's huge. 220, 225 at sixth grade. When I was in ninth grade, I it just was 315. 315 as a freshman. <laughs> as a How freshman. What do you think you weighed? Um, my, as a freshman, I weighed 185. Okay. So, and still it was all up at the wall at my high school and things like that. But so it paid off in sixth grade, this girl asked if she could t touch my pecs. And that was like the first time <laughs> I was ever That's like, what it's all about, right? yeah, I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, this is more than just like sports stuff. Like this is, yeah. this is kind of cool, but <laughs> it's a superpower. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. <laughs> That's it, awesome. Yeah. I always took to it. Yeah. So, so growing up at home with all those siblings, was it, I have, uh, there's four of us in my house and it was just loud. It was always loud. There's always something going on. Was it like that for you? Just, 100%. just chaotic and 100%. just, okay. and my dad being from New Jersey, there's like kind of that East coast brashness where it's like, we would get around the table. We would talk politics, you know, yeah. usually my dad and, and I didn't care about politics when I was a kid, but it was like, you know, we would talk and we would kind of argue my oldest sister who, you know, wasn't athletically inclined at all. She was just academically, she was great speech and debate. She, I think she won state and debate. So like my family just kind of, that's what we did. We just, we would get along, but it didn't sound like it. <laughs> yeah. Did, were you a good student in high school? No. Well, I was good in classes that I liked. So I was kind of always my MO. Like English hated it. You know, like I, my, my dad, I think, got called to my school a couple times for, I think I I tried uh, turning in a girl's notebook like this, this, you know, we had done all these assignments and I, I think I, she had done it earlier because she was going on vacation. I'm like, hey, just give me some of those pages. <laughs> So those types of class, like the things I didn't like, but science, you know, I was decent at and things like that. PE, no, but it was, <laughs> it was kind of like the classes I liked. So in college, I got serious about, about school, but in high school, didn't love it. What'd you study in college? So I was a biology psychology major, in integrated studies. And that was like, I was going to go into chiropractic, but that was where I was like, I kind of enjoyed what I was, you, you pick what field you want to go into. Mm -hmm. So I was picking mm -hmm. classes I enjoyed. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you, you have a real background in, uh, in fitness. And what I mean by that is, uh, there's a lot of people in our space that work out, look good, but they don't have the background, like let's say a coach or a trainer. Yeah. Like this is something you actually pursued, like understanding the human body, understanding exercise. Yeah. And so that's why you want, you were maybe going in that chiropractic. I was, yeah, space. I was going to go the chiropractic route. And I, I, so in high school, I, you know, football, basketball, baseball, and then ran track. And then what was your college, best sport? Football. So okay. I played college football, played outside, played running back in high school. Cause in Idaho, you can be a running back if you're a white kid. Like it, it, we, <laughs> we didn't have the athletes that you guys have in California is what I'm trying to say. Hey, so, it's the same out here. It's yeah. yeah it's yeah. one of those things that like I got to college, like, yeah, you're not a running back, man. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, but you know, you're athletic and in Idaho, it's like, we're going to give you the ball. But I played <laughs> linebacker in college and uh, yeah, just, Division two school, we mm -hmm. sucked, but it was like that's Justin's yeah, experience. That's yeah. like my same story. <laughs> Who'd you play? Where did you play at? Trinity, okay, in Chicago. Yeah. Okay, so we yeah. played like Humboldt. Okay, yeah, yeah like yeah, that yeah. was my first experience with Northern California, and that was a trip. Yep. But yeah, we played. We were in kind of in that conference, and uh, so we bust everywhere though. Mm. So we it was rough. Did, did you have you, any fitness heroes back then? I mean, you're obviously following it. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, obviously, like everyone, cliche Arnold. Mm -hmm. Like it was one of those things, Van Dam. Like we grew up, and I feel like this golden age of <laughs> like TNT yes, dude. Friday night was like this amazing time. Oh, Sylvester yeah, Stallone, massive and, superhero body yeah. guys, yeah. And and so that was those were all kind of all of, all of my heroes I would say and then of course like Walter Payton was he was because I was a running back in high school like Walter Payton for me was like a god yeah. like that's kind of who yeah. I looked at and I had all his VHSs about he used to run hills in like Mississippi so yeah, yeah. like that was kind of those were my fit like I would say fitness idols. Do you have any business yeah. sense back then? Because obviously you yeah. built your business through you know obviously YouTube and, and social media kind of before a lot of people were doing it. Did you have any? If you look back, would you say, oh yeah, I had a little bit of that? Not not really. I mean, hard work in that. Like again, when you we would 
every, we'd have to have a job growing up. Like, so my parents, I got a hand-me-down minivan when I was in high school. That's what I drove. That's my friends tough. actually called it the rate mobile. <laughs> <laughs> this is bad. This is bad because oh, you no. couldn't get, you could get in the sliding door, but you couldn't get out. Oh, that's why. So the only door you could get in <laughs> was the driver door. That's, that was, was the only panel. Door they didn't have out. windows. It was a Chevy too? Lumina and okay. it was like two-tone maroon and silver. And, it says free uh, candy on the side. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was sketchy, but no, it was character builder. But I think that I, I drove that because I didn't actually work year round because of sports and stuff like that. Like that was the only car I could afford was the hand me down. But we always had to like parents and stuff like going off to college is always like, hey, you pay 50 percent. We'll pay 50 percent. I got a, a scholarship for football. So that was kind of fortunate for that. But like, yeah, my parents never, never like I remember being like overdraft and in, in college. My dad being like tough titty your credits like dinged and mm. things like that oh, wow. and so yeah now as a kid were you like annoyed like oh come on dad totally. like help me out and but looking back do you feel like that was a good yeah i hate i hate admitting it but definitely looking back you know you, my friends it just kind of felt like they had everything mm -hmm. handed to them or or parents bailing them out um, at the time sounded amazing but looking back i'm like yeah I'll, I'll never parent like that either i'll never just give people people things what has the what has the relationship been like for you and your parents like the trajectory of it like you you grew up in a blended house yep. you sound like you were a little shit a little bit like so <sighs> did you have uh animosity towards them growing up has that At shifted? Times. okay yeah. i got kicked out of my house actually like my senior year half like it was funny because during football season my dad and i got along great i was in the <clears> newspaper i was all state like we, we got along great for some reason and then not during football season. I think it, things would, we always would butt heads a little bit more. Like I, I remember coming home. I had a girlfriend that was a couple years older than me, always trouble. Um, but I like to push the boundaries. And I think I came home a couple, couple minutes after curfew and like my dad just had thrown out all of my clothes and I was like, F this, I'm out of here. And like, so I went and lived with my friend um, for about two months until his parents were like, Hey, you need to go back home. I'm sure they like, <laughs> at first it was great, but then you have some other teenage kid in the house. And so, <laughs> We ended up, you know, I ended up going back home. But yeah, it was, it was a, there was a lot of probably butting heads, probably because my dad and I are pretty similar. Oh, really? But he was very like, again, six, seven kids at home. You're a teacher. Like he, I feel like he probably had a lot of stress and he, I kind of saw him, he was a good college athlete, but he kind of internalized that. And he, he was actually pretty heavy. Uh, like even though he was involved in sports growing up and stuff, when he got to, to be a teacher and a coach, he well over 300 pounds, but. So was there a point in your <clears throat> probably twenties or even thirties where you guys, that kind of came back around you guys got a better relationship? Yeah, for sure. I think it, it actually, so not to jump ahead too far, but I got, I got married early on to a, a girl who was L LDS at the time, who was mm. Mormon at the time, um, got baptized, like did the whole Mormon thing for like a year or two. And then we were both like, yeah, we we're, we're not really Mormon. And then we ended up getting divorced a couple years later. Um, she was working as a nurse. I was done playing football. We moved back to Idaho from St. George, Utah, where I was going to school. I was working at Texas Roadhouse. I had like 16 credits to finish. Didn't really know what I was doing. Did my first bodybuilding show at that time. Um, and was kind of just like this guy who always identified as a football player, always thought like NFL. And, and then when that didn't happen, it's kind of like, okay, what am I doing now? So she ended up cheating on me with a doctor that she worked with. And that was kind of that moved back in with my parents. And that's kind of where my dad uh -oh. and I, I think probably bonded. How old were you bonded. at this time? About 23. Yeah. Wow, so, so I was young. married real young. Real young. Yeah. That Utah, Idaho. Sure. So we got Average. married at 20. I was 21, got divorced right before I turned 24. Was that hard? Yeah, it was. I think cause I probably would never have of quit on like a relationship. I probably like, if you're miserable, like you just work it out and eventually things get better. But I think it was probably in hindsight, the best thing that ever happened just cause being married that young, like you don't know who you are. Like I was just thinking about this today is my wife and I's one year anniversary. And I was like, it's, it's more about not necessarily finding that right person, but being in a good space yourself to then oh, kind yeah. of, and I, I feel like I was mm -hmm. never it took me a long time to get to that spot where like I was ready to get married, I mm. think. So how did, mm. how did, how did this, uh, you know, business side of you start? How did it all, how did it switch from, you're like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm not doing football to, yep. okay, I think I'm going to do this fitness thing and turn this into something. Well, after kind of the divorce, it was kind of a long, hard look in the mirror. And there were some things I was like, yeah, I, you know, there was some truth into some of the things that we probably fought about. And, and then it was like, okay, you know, what are you doing? Bodybuilding.com was in Boise, Idaho at the time. I would volunteer like my time. I did some bodybuilding shows, but then I was like, I got to go back to school, move back down to St. George, Utah, finish my degree. It was only a semester at the same time, 
prepped for the muscle and fitness male model search. Oh. The good old, like, yeah, yeah. in Vegas at the Olympia. This is before men's physique. Uh-huh. Um, so I was 16 credits, working at Texas Roadhouse down in St. George at the time, and then prepping for this show. And it was, like, 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. at night. Like, I would leave, leave the house, my grandparents' house. They let me stay there. And I'd be gone, like, all day workout labs for my classes, then Texas Roadhouse, and then like do cardio at night. And that was the first time I really felt like I realized like, okay, how, how hard do you have to work? Like didn't have a ton of balance, didn't date, didn't, you know, didn't do anything fun really, but it was like nose to the grind, finish what you started. And then that kind of is how everything came about because after the muscle and fitness male model search, it was optimum nutrition signed with them, bodybuilding.com. I won their spokes model search and then kind of just, evolved from there this time during facebook instagram wasn't even around yet so it was uh was there a moment when that was happening where you're like huh this is this could be a business or was it more like let's just see what this turns into it was kind of like let's see what it turns into i remember shooting there's a one i think he shot iron man magazine when it was around still oh i remember that bill comstock i think was his name Mm -hmm. and we were shooting he's like you know there's no money in bodybuilding right (laughs) and i was like well, I'm just kind of doing this for fun. Like I'm going to be a chiropractor type of a thing. But then I was fortunate enough when I did sign with Optimum, it was just again, right place, right time, bodybuilding.com. They were kind of at their peak and that having both, you know, volunteering my time when I was back in Boise, um, they knew who I was when I won the competition. It was like bodybuilding.com and Optimum Nutrition. They were doing things together on their on, on bodybuilding.com, like the big man on campus. That was a bodybuilding.com optimum nutrition collaboration. And then from there on, it was like, Hey, optimum bodybuilding.com send me to as many expos as you, as you want. I, I continued to work at Texas roadhouse cause they were super flexible with my schedule, but I was like, send me around the globe. I want to see the world type of a thing. And that was actually, I, I, again, I really didn't know it, but that was how I built my following was meeting people in mm. Singapore, Malaysia, China, mm. Australia. Like we, I just would do 15 expos a year and just, just sit there in line, talk to people, talk to them about their fitness goals. They'd get a picture. They put it as their profile picture. Then their friend would like follow along. Oh, wow. mm. So it was like an organic as it could wow. get. Now at that time, are you already signed with Optimum Nutrition? Yep. Or is okay, so you did sign. Yeah, now, are you I, making good money at the time, or is it more like you just you're just traveling and yeah. and yeah. So the nice thing was I remember I was super happy. Optimum, like bodybuilding.com was five hundred dollars a month in supplements. I was just happy That's to get just supplements. Like crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Same, yeah. Same thing. And then Optimum was a little bit more. Um it was like a thousand a month plus supplements. But then, so I was like actually slinging supplements to like my local supplement dealers, like the, like the, lo- <laughs> yeah. the local supplement stores. I'd be like, I was getting like five hundred dollars from each. I was going in, I'm like, hey, how much do you want for this stuff? <laughs> and so, like, I was, I was making, I was making money doing that. And then, of course, Texas Roadhouse, but it wasn't a lot. But the nice thing was, is I just remember I'd never left the country before. Um, and they're paying for you to do that. Paying, and it's yeah. business class because it's their policy as a company for Optimum Nutrition yeah, was cool. over a certain certain distance. You get business class, and you know when I'm there, they paid me a little bit extra, and then food and everything else. What are you about twenty five ish, right there? Yeah, twenty five, twenty six in there. Okay, so, and then it was like that was like my life for seven years. I felt like oh, competing wow. in there. You know, men's physique came around, and I was the third men's physique pro because kind of. That muscle and fitness contest was kind of like the spinoff to see if this physique ca- category. We got so much shit. Men's physique guys at the start. It was like, oh, men's you're bikini. Yeah, 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 men's bikini, men's bikini. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And it was just, it was funny, but yeah. it was, um, you know, it was the massive category. People wanted it. Oh, yeah. No, it's changed sure. a lot. Uh, it, boy, well, now it looks like fucking bodybuilding. Yeah. Now, just this short time that I was out of it, I was like, yeah. holy crap, this went like. It's insane. Yeah. It, it's just like, I look at the guys now and I'm like, whoa, who is writing this criteria for this sport? Because like when I came out, it was, you know, they wanted the surfer look. They wanted like. UK. Something attainable. Yeah. And that was why I, so I went from natural bodybuilding. That was the, when I lived in Boise, I did like three natural bodybuilding shows. One that they said was natural, but definitely wasn't. Nobody was natural that one. Um, and then Men's Physique came around. I'm like, well, oh, I can be natural and do this. I just remember getting on stage at that first Olympian and be like, yeah, okay. The, the, the game plan has changed. <laughs> yeah, real quick. So, have you stayed natural this whole time? Or have no. You had- so, well, and for me, it's always, I always was, like when I would say natural, it was always like I would, there would always be a little bit of, when it was like the McGuire stuff back in the day. Oh, Andrew Stenadan yeah. on Pro Hormones. So it started off kind of with that. Yeah. And again, it wasn't like, oh, I'm not, it's not an illegal compound. In Utah, there are all, all these mom and pop pharmacies 
um, that would produce these pro hormones even well after you know it was it was kind of done now some of these were like uh cuz that's what I did in the early 2000s I yep. buy them cuz they're over the counter but they are actually designer steroids like yeah. super drawl and oh, we didn't know Paladrol. that like, yeah, I was yeah. just like oh it's this is fine I'm getting yeah. it over the counter I got gyno like crazy <laughs> yeah. on this yeah. stuff yeah. and then I think that the second Mr Olympia I was like okay you know like if I'm going to compete if I want to do this ultimately I was like I kind of stepped away from the sport because it's like I, I don't want to be doing three, four different compounds. And right now I'm not, you know, like I, I've done TRT in the past, but I want to eventually have kids right now. So we're looking at doing some peptide stuff with like mm -hmm. enclomiphene and those types of things just to get my natural testosterone mm -hmm. up. But yeah, I think that that second year there was I was on testosterone and I was just like losing my mind. Like when oh, I was like, oh my gosh. We actually got pregnant when I was on, on, on TRT. Yeah. From the yeah. HCG. Yeah, they just kept me on HCG at the same time. And that's what, that's like, I, I, I wanted to see how I get, get my natural testosterone and then if it's still in the crapshoot. Because like last, I got tested two weeks ago and it was like 340. So that's what I did. So I went, yeah. so after competing for four years or whatever, I and I was taking high doses of testosterone. Yep. I go, okay, and then we were together, we're going to have a kid. I said, I want to go natural and see if I can just build this myself and yep. just sleep, diet, do all the right, yep. turn all the right knobs. It was probably what, a year and a half, almost, Took a while. Mm -hmm. almost two years. And I made a little bit of headway from like taking me from like 200 something. Yeah. But I only got to about, I think it was like 350, 400. Yeah. Still that's about what good. I'm at right now. And it, yeah. And so, and that's where eventually, I, and then I remember talking to the doctor and he's like, no, we can, we can put you back on hormone therapy. We'll run HCG with it. You'll still be able to get pregnant. And that was kind of the deciding factor for me to get back on H, uh, HRT. So and that and that you probably can speak to this as well. That was always kind of like it was this constant tug of war for me. It was like, do I do I just go after it and and say, hey, chalk it up to the sport and just right. do what these? I, you know, I had coaches say, hey, Steve, if you want to compete, you need to do this, this, and this. And I'd be like, oh, I'll try that other stuff. And it was never it was never quite the same. Like yeah. I again, being a kid that benched, you know, I was always a big, strong kid, but. It's a different level. I can compete in natural bodybuilding. I just remember seeing Bundia on stage that first oh, yeah. Olympia and being like, okay, that that that's the physique yeah. that this class is going to be. I think Mark Flex Anthony won that one though. And yeah, that was he was the last of the kind of like not so great looking bodies. I, if you go back and look, if you pull up, pull up Mark Anthony. A uh, men's physique champion and compare him to what so, what you what is winning today and yeah well and the funny thing was <laughs> he wouldn't with even that, get last he would get laughed off the stage on those shows now it's crazy and when that was my life at the time I was devastated that was the first show I really had ever lost was that Mr. oh so Lund? you probably got a little taste of the politics right out the gate oh my gosh I was told I had to get people I had to announce things to my followers to tell them that I thought it was fair. And it was it was so interesting how oh shit they, they made, because at that time I don't know if you remember even you know I'll probably never compete again because but if I did I'm like I'm I'm ruining my chances here it was one of those things that it was FMG was a management company yeah. you remember FMG yeah. yep they had their guys yeah. in this Optimum Nutrition was like hey we we won't work with that management group. So you, if you want to be with them, you're not going to be with us. I'm like, well, I don't, I don't care about competing that much. I, th I still think I can win it without being part of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely wasn't the case. Like the top three out of the top five guys were with them. It was pretty clear how things were going. But the like the bodybuilding.com forums at the time, I remember like kind of reading on them, and there was just like people were throwing a fit so much so where like the IFBB, a couple of the judges, one of them now is no longer a judge about five to six years ago. He stopped, stopped judging and he like came back and kind of, you know, talked to me about the politics after he was out of it. But they, they were like, Hey man, can you make a statement saying you thought it was thought the judging was fair? Wow. And so like, I was like, well, you know, I didn't know if it, you know, wasn't fair or not. I just was like, it didn't, it didn't feel right to me. Like oh, the, was, a lot of the guys that we thought were going to be in the top one, two, three were, were nowhere well, I, I explained to people when they ask about it, like, the reason why, because I mean, you sound like a, a poor sport. When you, you do. Talk, if you say like, oh, yeah. the politics. Yeah. So I was like really like hesitant to ever say, but when you explain like how it works, you, I say, listen, with these shows, okay, first of all, they don't make a lot of money, so they need money. Yeah. The people that donate to get their names on the banners and everything like that 100%. also happen to have teams yeah. of athletes that are in it. 
who are also helping pay the wages to the judges that are there to judge these events. One thousand percent. So, you know, you got a guy like maybe me or you who's not represented by anybody who comes on the scene and stuff like that. And we're competing up against, you know, whoever it is at that time that is donating the most money and their three athletes are there like. You're going to have to – and what I thought was crazy, I don't know if you had the same attitude. Like, I was so, like, confident about myself and my abilities. I was like, I'll fucking still win. Like, yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. I was uh, too. Yeah, uh, I had that attitude. Yeah. My first show, I came out, just blew the competition away, and I didn't even make first call-outs. Yeah. And the crowd went – and this was in the early, the early showings – the crowd was freaking out and booing so much because it was that dramatic. And in the evening, they hopped me all the way up to four, which oh, you rarely did. see that. They, oh, wow. Yes. You weren't even on the first call out. Wasn't even on the first call out. Wow. Everybody freaked out because yeah. I was like so, so more shredded than everybody. And look, yeah. it was not even close. And they, they, all the booing and stuff went on. Yeah. And then when I get, I come out the, in the evening show, they jumped me all the way from like sixth or seventh, all the way up to That's fourth wild. place. Yeah, but that doesn't happen very often. Put me at fourth, which keeps me out of qualifying for national. Ah. So I still have to do another show, which was like, that was my first taste of it. Yeah, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> See how it this is, works. It's so true. And I, 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 and I actually had some politics behind me. Like I had big bodybuilding.com and optimal nutrition, but again, it was specifically like this management group that, since then, they did away with it pretty soon after that because people started kind of looking into it. And again, like, I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, I was the best on the stage. But it definitely wasn't the people who were – there were some people that got, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth. I think the guy who got seventh was just in amazing shape, and I thought he should have won it. But it was interesting, and I quickly realized after that that I was like, okay, competing is not going to be my end-all, be-all. Like, I'm not going to just be Mm-mm. an IFBB pro competitor. Like, you're not going to see it in my bio, like, yeah, type yeah. of a thing where I'm not going to just ride my coattails on that. And so, like, I still would compete, you know, every now and then, but I quickly found, like, I just, I don't like the idea, I just, again, of of It's got to be steroids. a hard transition for an athlete because if you play a sport, like, you win, I mean, most yeah. sports, right? You Black win or you lose, mm-hmm. right? Um, there's some, you know, judging with the, with the refs, but usually you win or you lose. Yeah. It's so subjective. Yeah. It's like, you look better than you do. And it's really not it's, even a sport. I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't really count it as a sport. It's right. like, a, it's yeah. like an art show. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Oh, blue ribbon to you. It's we like your art. It's, the yeah. most, the most sport about it is the, the, I think the, it's the training, the yeah. training yeah. and the dieting part. That yeah. Yeah. The, the actual yeah, the event discipline. is not, there's nothing sport about the event. Right. But Which was you, so weird. Why guys backstage would get weird. Like they'd like, just like, <laughs> there was like this weird, like, <laughs> like, 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 and some of the competitors like would peacock in you. Yeah. Well, yeah. they would talk like not even, not even when I was doing it, but even afterwards, like at these press conferences where they talk shit and the IFBB, I think loved it. Cause, but it was like, you guys aren't actually doing anything against each other. You're just going to stand up there and flex. Like there is zero competitiveness that needs to be going on here. So it was always interesting. That's to hilarious. Me. I like that you talked about um, how you strong you were as a kid, because I think a lot of people attribute um, people's success with their physiques to the drugs or the steroids, yeah. but uh, the genetics play a much larger. Yeah, yeah. Like right now you got low testosterone yeah. off everything. And you look more fit than most people who work out uh, for for years and years. So, and I want to say that because people listen are like, "Oh, that's yeah. it." Doesn't play the the role people think. Yeah, I definitely. I mean, I always say this to to people when I meet them at expos, like when they're like, "Oh, I want to be Mr. Olympia. I want to do this or that," and I'm like, "Hey, don't necessarily hang your your hat on a title." Because I'll, I'll be honest, some of the most lonely times I ever had was after I'd won a show, and then I was like, "Okay, I don't have any goals. What now?" And so I was like, you know, like have goals, but don't you know, this winning or losing type thing. Cause ultimately there's going to be a Phil Heath. who's just a genetic freak. Like mm-hmm. you might train your ass off. You might train harder than him, but Usain Bolt, he could not train for a year and he's still going to beat us all on a hundred meter dash. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like there is a huge genetic component that comes into anything. When you get it to that, that level, that top level of yeah. anything, usually genetics yeah. and hard work end up, pulling through did you see that too in football where you hit that sort of genetic freak level where you're like dude there's a whole nother level here yeah no yeah i was i was like yeah i was captain on the team i was 6'1 230 like i I had a really good bench press but you're at a different category when you start talking an nfl outside linebacker you gotta be six you remember the first time you got hit by someone in college you're like oh what the hell yeah no i just remember the speed of the game so we had two I, i played at a junior college for one year and we had two guys that were kind of D1 dropouts that had to come back to junior college. Uh, One of them ended up going on to USC and blocking for Reggie Bush and Matt Leinart and then playing for the Cardinals. And this was the biggest human being in my life. Mm-hmm. Like I'd ever seen in my life. He was Deuce Latui was his name. 
and you could see like his face touched his face mask. Yeah. <laughs> like it was he had, they had to order they had to order a special helmet for him, but he he was he ended up getting like uh, fined. He played for the Cardinals and then Seattle, but he like couldn't keep under like four hundred pounds. He was massive, but he could move too. And he there was a we were doing ones on one scrimmage, and he just there was a pulling, and I didn't see him, and I just got ear holding. I I swear I was in the air for like three seconds. It felt like eternity. And I just got up and I was like, what oh, there happened? He is. Oh really? yeah. That's a big boy. Oh, yeah. wow. Deuce, um, Deuce made like a size eight hat. Just look tiny. Like a, like oh, a monkey. Funny. Like it just was like, <laughs> he made it, he made it like those little hats that those, I mean, I think a perfect example is, is if you ever watched the series, I love the series on Netflix, the last chance you, where yeah. you get all the like yep. D one guys that were dropouts, didn't do their, cl- yes. their classes. What happens when you put them all together it's and crazy. It's, it just destroy everybody. Yeah, it's it is. Like, <laughs> it's, it's wild. It is. It's yeah. We had another defensive end that ended up going to Oklahoma. So you just, you got those freaks. And I quickly realized I was like, Hey, I'm good. I'm not great. And yeah, it'd be great to go to that level. Yeah. So when did you when did your business really start taking off? Because you're doing this, you're going to expos. Yep. Yeah, were you um, vlogging at that same time? So I started vlogging when I when I started doing the expos. What was I, the, what made you start doing that? So there was a girl, so I I'd now been divorced. There was a girl I was dating at the time whose brother was like YouTube royalty. And oh, really? His, his name was Shay Carl. Um, and he he started started the Shay Tards. And like so he was he, He's an LDS guy. I think that he like literally just vlogged his life every day for like seven years. Oh, wow. He vlogged. Bro, this is like before the Casey Neistat. This is and like- Casey actually collabed with him and talks about how how Shay was like Kate, one of Casey's people that he looked wow. up to. So like, oh, wow. He was an OG and he, Maker Studio. Have you guys ever heard of Maker Studio? Oh, is that him right there? That's Shay. Yeah. Okay. He looks familiar though. He's super, mm. you know, great, great personality. He's been through some things, I think, in the last couple of years, but- um, yeah, I just, I just remember seeing how, what he was doing and Maker Studio, he was one of the founders of, they ended up selling to Disney for like 400 mil. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So I quickly, Whoa. like he, they didn't sell at the time, but he was making great money living in LA. He was from Idaho. So I was like, oh, no one's really doing this in the fitness space. There's a couple, Mike, Mike Chang, six pack abs. Oh yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Hey, and then uh, there was one other guy. What was his Scooby? name? Scott, uh, uh-huh. Scott Herman. Oh, Scott goes oh. that far back. He goes back scott like maybe not mike chang days but scott herman was one of the first i knew he went back i didn't know he went that far yeah no scott herman was and then you had like rob riches kind of in that in that time period but that's when i kind of started vlogging so you're like oh this is an opportunity here yeah i was just like you know what i'm i'm kind of seeing cool places i'm putting it on social media already there was some vlogs that kind of worked its way into like the how-to videos did it feel natural for you or did it feel like there was a a hard learning curve for you what did it feel like it it honestly felt pretty natural, probably mm. only because I, I I had done enough camera stuff with Optimum and Bodybuilding.com and then cell phones at the day, like selfies were huge and things yeah. like that. So uh, it never felt awkward. People have talked about that, like, I can't vlog because I just can't get in. I never You're a bit of an anything. anomaly in my opinion. I feel So we've had an opportunity now in the last eight years to talk to a lot of different people that have, you know, are popular on YouTube or social media. And more often than not, the people that are like you, I think have social skills and like, and have personality and some mm. of that actually don't do very well on YouTube. The people that are more introverted yeah. Yeah. And, and are they become a character. Yes. On YouTube. Yes. They yeah. are the ones that are the, and that's what we've experienced is like, I, I trip out or not anymore because it's happened so many times, but we'll get this, you know, 2 million YouTube followers. Yeah. They, I meet yeah. them and they can't make eye contact. No. They're quiet. No. They're awkward. And you're like, Whoa! This is like a different kid. Yeah. So so true. You're not I, like that. You... I, I, yeah, I've met so many. Same thing. Shay wasn't like that either. Shay Shay was like gregarious, outgoing, very personal. And I just kind of watch him. Like so, I kind of picked up YouTube stuff from him in person when I'd meet people. I kind of always modeled that after Jamie Eason, Bodybuilding.com. All right. She was kind of like I would see her at expos, and she was always like, "Hi, my name is Jamie." When people would wait in line for her, like they know who you are, but she would introduce herself. And I always thought that like resonated with people. It was always like. Hey, you, you know, she was a real person. She introduced herself just like you would meeting someone for the first time. And I was like, if anyone ever waits in line for me, I want to be like Jamie. Mm. So that's kind of where I picked up at. But Shay online, like, or on, on YouTube, he'd have his weird little camera and he just, he would turn into like Shay to 10 out of 10 volume. Like that was what it was like. It was like, he would just turn up his personality. And so I kind of just picked that up off of him. Yeah, I think I'd seen it enough people do it or been around it yeah. and been in other people's videos at the time that it was kind of like okay, just just talk about where you're at, talk to people, show people, ask people questions on camera, things like that. Did you did you have a like a staff or team no. edit things for? Is all you? Uh, 
No, I, I quickly got a videographer because okay. I saw like Shay had a videographer because editing it wasn't my, mm. definitely wasn't my forte. But that was when, you know, Instagram had just kind of started. YouTube, you know, was still just kind of a, a weird thing that, you know, people would watch, but it wasn't like today where like kids want to be YouTubers. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So weird. Now you look back and especially today, right? We have this because you started before like this super popular cancel court culture do you look back and are there things that you like you regretted or that you've gotten shit for? You're like, God, I wish I probably wouldn't have put that out there. Like I'm probably, I was probably more conservative then or in terms of what I would say yeah. than I am now. Oh, interesting. Like I, I, and I feel like I'm now more awkward on camera now too. It's like That's weird. Funny. Like I've gone through this change where I'm like, I now, maybe I'm just out of practice, but I now don't like vlogging as much. I don't like even posting on social media as much. It's just one of those things I feel like, in COVID and stuff, I just, I kind of got away from doing it. And I, I feel like now I, I, I'm having a harder time getting back Do you feel like it. maybe too, it's partly, I mean, I think kind of your age where yeah. you're at in your life. Yeah. I mean, you and I talked on the phone a while back and I remember you kind of sharing that with me. Yeah. Like, I think you just get to a place in your life where just like, okay, do I really want to have to do this? Yeah. I don't want to try to do like a viral TikTok dance necessarily. <laughs> like if, if we're having fun and you know, we're something comes about organically, but I, I, I know I knew social media had changed when, or, or, or how, maybe how important it seemed like it was to people when you would see these bodybuilders at expos, like they were, you could tell they were just waiting for their next meal, signing things. Now they're doing TikTok dance. Like you got full on big bodybuilders or <laughs> oh, world's no. strongest men. And it just shows you like, in order to get paid, you got to play that game of social media. And again, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. Do you remember like that, that the trajectory of that too, as far as like, as it was coming up, it was so much fun. You loved it. Yeah. And then what was the, well, and I was kind of to your point, mm -hmm. I never felt like it was work. I was just like, I'm out here just creating content, showing people what I'm doing. I'm having fun. I'm in all of these different places. And then I feel like it's become work, I would say, in the last couple of years because it, I, I feel like it's kind of just redundant. I see the same thing. I don't like it. It's, it's new. It's exciting because you haven't done it before. Yeah. But doing a how to train biceps for the seventh time on YouTube is it, it gets old. So it's kind of like, okay, let's. How do we, you know, and that you either get deeper into the science of things, which there is an audience for, I think. Um, and that's, that's kind of like, as I get older, I'm like, kind of, do I want to go more of that route? But I think it's, it's hard because again, like there's, I always called the, the, I've, I've said this before on another podcast, the applesauce and like the, the shit you get in the applesauce, the kids food. Like when you're a kid, you have to get them applesauce, but then you have to get them peas and carrots cut up inside, like the baby food. And I always feel like that's on social media. There's shirt off sexiness, like yep. selling that, that's the applesauce. But then hopefully you have some peas and carrots behind it or Got else it. people are just going to end up, you know, moving on yeah, to the next Good person. example of what you says, our friend Ben Greenfield, he started in, you know, kind of health and fitness. And then his podcast started getting more, he, in this, he talks about this, he had to get more and more granular and more science based. Yeah. And then for himself, you're done. At some point you hit like all the topics and then you got to get deeper and weirder and deeper yeah. and weirder. Um, so that kind of ends the whole, like, take your shirt off flex type of deal. That's got a shelf life in my opinion. Oh yeah. Um, we were lucky because we just worked with everyday average people. That's what we always did. Yeah. Uh, and so that's endless. Yeah. It's endless to find different ways of communicating fitness and health in ways that can resonate with non-fitness fanatics, just the average person. Yep. So that's what we've been able to do. Have you thought like where you want to kind of yeah. move? Okay. Yeah. So like after the biggest loser, so I was the coach on the biggest loser yeah. the last season and it was a good experience in like, I was super hesitant to go on the show because of kind of the past that they had had and how like- well, Go into detail, what do you mean? Well, you know, we're talking about cancel culture, like I think one of the good things kind of like this, this what they were doing early on in The Biggest Loser was pretty, I think, brutal. Yeah. The, yeah. the crash, it was all about losing weight. Yeah. And I kind of went into this idea, like I even told them like, hey, if you guys, their big thing was we're rebranding the show, we want to do it healthy. We had a doctor on staff. And they just assured me like, hey, we're going to do this the healthiest that we can do. All of these people are kind of this last ditch effort. They tried other things. They're in desperate spots. They could stay home and try to get a trainer, try to get other people to help them lose weight. They've tried that before. Their, their idea of coming on this show, being immersed 24 hours into this, they had their phones taken away. And there are some good parts of the show. There are some parts that I really struggled with basically the TV aspect of things. I couldn't see my contestants. I didn't think we had enough support with off air cameras because they wanted to capture all of our interactions. If we had an interaction, they wanted to be on camera. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fine if you want to run 20, you know, 24 hours a day. But if you, we only have bandwidth for three hours a day, 
who's going to be there looking after him, training, doing other things for the rest of the time if I can't be there? So you weren't even allowed to talk to them when the camera was No. On? Oh. Like it was a lot of times we weren't. Sometimes oh, wow. we were. A lot of times we weren't. They wanted, like if we were talking nutrition, we were talking emotional stuff, like they wanted that camera right, right, right there. I did see, though, again, blood work wise, markers, people that were pre diabetic at the show, they were no longer pre diabetic, things like that. So I do feel like, again, 50% of anyone, of any population, when you look at when they lose a lot of weight, 50% are going to gain it right back. Right. Biggest loser was no different than that. 50% right. are going to gain it right back. But I kind of I kind of looked at it as an opportunity to get back to training people. It had like, been years since I'd actually trained people. You know, I would train people at, at expos, you know, a seminar, but to work with somebody again. And the rewarding aspect of that, way cooler than anything like have you ever wise. worked with anybody like that because you're, you're you i'm assuming there's a bit of a self-selection bias when you're working with people at expos yeah, and you know sure. they're they're like somewhat fitness people they've yeah. worked out before hey i want to get shredded yeah. i want to lose 15 pounds but on the biggest loser you're getting like people who have serious obese uh, yeah and challenges like and challenge, yep. really really hard relationships with food and their yep. bodies had you ever worked with anybody like that before um not to the extent that we did. Were you, you surprised know. by anything? Was it was it like did you expect something and then get something else? Or I, I, I think I was su surprised only in that like everyone has a unique story. Like yeah. there's the the stories that you hear of real trauma in people's life, people blaming themselves for deaths of loved ones, or um, but then at, at the same time, when you get them the help that they need, like again we had a, a psychologist, we had a dietitian. A lot of it wasn't in my wheelhouse. Like I can't deal with someone's trauma, but working through that, um, as you start peeling back excuses, I don't, you know, not the trauma part, but other excuses, you realize it's, there's a little bit of us that you can see where it's like, Hey, these are just things you're going to have to, we're gonna have to get past together. We're, we're here, we're able to help you out, but it's no different than what the person who's 30 pounds overweight is dealing with. These people just had some other circumstances that led to even more weight gain could be hormone issues, thyroid issues, but most of the time it was trauma. Yeah. So did you, you said it was very meaningful for you. Or it was crazy how it, it took so much. Like it was a lot of work being, you know, there immersed in it. But I think that it was probably working and some of the most memorable interactions were in like people were leaving like and they you saw how devastated it was because they're like i don't know how i'm going to deal with life going back yeah without someone they were they were so scared mm -hmm. um and i remember one of the first episodes big rob um he was a guy that played college football probably 400 pounds six eight so he knew how to work but like he just had these knees that were you know he had mm -hmm. bad bad knees for how big he was and i think i i felt like i had let him down because we didn't get him to move on to the next, you know, he, he was, he was off the show after that week. And I felt like, it was like, man, if we could have just lost a little, but he ended up going on and losing like 90 pounds over the course of the oh, next great. year and a half. So did you ever have, cause I remember going through this and I think this is common with a lot of trainers where there's this like realization at some point where, cause at first you think, well, they just got to do this. They just yep. got to do that. And it's just, yep. you just got to do it. But then there's this realization that's like, they're not, they're, they're not like me. Like, I love this. This yep. is what I, so obviously I do this for a living. This is a regular person. This is not their favorite thing in the world to yeah. do. Uh, this is going to take a lot more effort and work on my part. Did you ever have that realization? We're like, okay, this is mind blowing. Okay. I remember there was a workout where we were one of the first workouts and she felt like she was having a heart attack. I'm like, that's just your heart beating fast. That's just what happens when we, we do cardio. Like you're on the treadmill right now. She was legit freaking out thinking like there was something massively wrong with her. And there was, she had just never felt, she'd never done a sport. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the most exercise she probably got was walking up stairs and she was literally afraid for her life doing cardio. And it was just like, that's crazy. Wild, yeah. right? Yeah. I remember the first time having someone like that, like do uh, like bicep curls with dumbbells <laughs> and the and then the burning. Yeah. yeah. Drop them, right? Yeah. Drop the weights. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, my muscles are burning. Like, whoa. Like, it's that's freaky. Yeah. Wild. And then know? the soreness the next day, they're yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, you hurt crazy. me. You hurt me yesterday. Yeah. The, yeah. the crazy the crazy part about it is that they're, uh, the relationship that they have with that kind of pain, they don't have that yeah. relationship. Whereas you're an athlete, you know what it feels like yeah. to hurt and it feels like there's a good hurt and there's a bad hurt. Yep. They just don't, they don't know that. So it's a huge hurdle for a lot of people. And I think a lot of coaches and trainers don't understand that yeah. until you work with like yeah. someone like that. You know, I remember I get questions like, where am I supposed to feel this? I'm like, what? Yeah. Like, you're doing a tricep press down. What do you right. mean? Where are you supposed to feel this? It always kind of, you know, blew me away. Was there, was there a, a, a struggle? Cause it's obviously, look, I know you're saying that you went into it and you're trying to do it the healthiest way possible. Yep. Um, and I, 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 I 100% believe you. 
Um, but it's still a show. Yep. It's still a show. It's still entertainment. It can't yeah. be like you would do it in real life. 1,000. Because if you do it the way, yeah, the right the way drama. to do it, yeah, the right way to do it in real life would be super boring. There'd be no way you'd make exactly. that into a show. Yeah. It was still a game show at the end. Like there was a winner at the end of it. Yeah. Did you have any struggles with that? All the time. Okay. The first week I about walked off. Really? I was, I was so done. They ended up bringing in actually a new producer because the producer was, that was there was freaking out because people weren't losing weight fast enough. And I just, and he was there on previous shows and I just lost it. I, I was ready to go home. I was like, I'm not doing this. If, if this is what you want, if you're going to get sit here and talk to us about how these, you're not seeing big enough numbers, I'm done. Because I'm like, I thought you wanted to do something different. We're not going to see crazy wow. numbers. And so it was, there was a real struggle. And again, like, I, I didn't want to be, I'd never done TV before. It was like 150 people on set. It was kind of slow moving again, like hurry up and wait all the time. And, and I've often thought like, hey, give me, you know, three people and, and, and you, a YouTube camera and like we can make some some real changes. But our and this is kind of what I've, we've done lately with Fitness Culture, the app company that we have. We just took a client on like six months ago. Successful guy, 33 years old, built a super successful business, kind of was a single single dad in, in some of the things he'd been dealing with in life. And it just was 60 pounds overweight, like still a decent athlete, but working with him, able to do it slow. I was like, Hey, this mm. is, this is a lot better. I could see how, you know, he, he actually gained some muscle while he lost body fat, while he lost weight even. And it was like, okay, if I, if I could do this with YouTube, like the biggest loser S type thing, mm -hmm. um, again, but people, people on TV wanted to see that hundred pounds in 12 weeks. Well, we so. talked about that. We talked about doing that. Remember when we first started our YouTube yeah. channel about making a Biggest loser, right? But the reason why we never did is because we know it wouldn't be entertaining enough. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be like many, a year long, be too, too many long, yeah. like yeah. weeks of no weight loss, no yeah. nothing, just staying the same. Like I mean, it's taken six, seven months for for this gentleman to lose fifty seven pounds. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, when you do the math, on and that's that, actually relatively fast. Yeah, that's it, fast. seven months. And but again, he was a guy who no injuries, crazy mobility for a guy that was. I would always say, you're not fat, you're just deconditioned. Because the minute he got back in, mm. the minute he got back into shape, like he, he didn't have these injuries, he didn't have mobility issues. He was able to do a lunge, a deep squat, yeah. And so we were able to 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 lose it fairly quickly. And for him, it was a lot of diet stuff too. But it was like on the show, it's yeah, you're not, you don't have the luxury of being like, hey, you lost four mm. pounds this week. That's great. You're like, you lost four pounds this week. You got to go home. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's insane. So, so you, you know, you you had some popularity on YouTube, and I, I would say, especially then, and even now, more flexibility to say what you want, be yourself. Then you go on, uh, I guess, like network TV, yeah. which is much more produced, much more controlled. Uh, did you feel like there was a big difference? And did you notice uh, afterwards? a huge spike in recognition from it? Or were you already so well-known before that it didn't make well, that big of a difference? you doubled. Didn't you double in size? I think you were... From the Biggest Loser? Yeah. No. At that time, Biggest Loser didn't do anything for growth. Oh, shit. Really? It didn't do any. Like, if you look back... Because you were already so... Yeah, if you yeah. look back... Yeah, I my, know you were already well my, over a million people. Yeah, no, Biggest Loser, I actually, I think... I, I And I was kind of expecting that from an outsider, thinking, oh, like this will be a whole new demographic. Completely different demographic. Like, you have your... The people that watch The Biggest Loser, uh, mostly female... And a little bit older. Right. My demographic is younger males. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it necessarily, it oh. actually kind of, I think, alienated me a little bit from the bodybuilding community. They're like, Steve, we don't want to see you posting about overweight people. Like, it was interesting because. Oh, that's interesting. Weird. Yeah, it was interesting because those guys, I think, that followed you for the shirt off, you know, yeah. like inspiration stuff. Not interested in they that. They weren't interested in that. So it actually, I don't know if it was, you know, I gained some followers and lost some followers, but. Um, kind of the long run, it was it was a wash. If anything, there was probably some brand brands out there that were like, oh, you have some credibility in doing a actual television show that liked it, but nothing that was life changing. And I didn't really think it was going to be because it wasn't on it wasn't on an NBC or it was on USA, which again, still a popular mm -hmm. network, but not the same as I did not. TV. I did not think that at all. I assume that you probably got double. Um, wow. It's an interesting time, right? Because what were the average, do you know how many viewers would watch? A they never episode? really, yeah, they never really, they talked about like what it was before, like when we were in there, like, Hey, this is the legacy you guys have up sure. to live up to type of a thing, but they never really talked about it. It kind of, I think because it wasn't as dramatic, it wasn't as drastic. There wasn't, you know, Jillian Michaels yelling and screaming at people again, like you were saying. Mm. It was a little bit more boring 
to the people that had seen The Biggest Loser before. Plus, I feel like we're in this time now because you're relatively close to our age where for us, like, I mean, even now, like if I'm on a newspaper, not that they don't exist anymore, but if let's say I was on a newspaper, <laughs> that would feel like more of a big deal because yeah. when I was a kid, that was a big deal, even although now yep. it's nothing at all. Magazines are the same. Thing. Yeah, so exactly. Um, where, you know, network TV feels like it's this big deal, but I bet you probably get more eyes on you on like an Instagram yeah. live or reel or something yeah. than you would on something like that, you know? Yeah, so that's probably that's, why it was more of a wash. And I think that's probably why they were. I did not. I just assumed that you would get, regardless, I still would have thought you would have got way more eyeballs yeah. and traction. So did, so did they even pay very well? Because I would think they tried to leverage the, the. It didn't, it didn't pay bad. I remember thinking, oh, that, that was like, you know, I think it was 200,000. Oh, okay. So it wasn't great. I don't, yeah. I didn't, for me, it was like, okay, if I, if I stayed home, and really worked on, you know, the app and things like that. Like it wasn't life changing or anything, but at the same time, it was like, there was some opportunity cost though, because I had to be on set for, you know, 10 weeks. So you couldn't do other stuff. Basically. Couldn't, yeah. There was zero. I think I had one day off in that eight weeks. And that was the the thing that a lot of people, we did have weekends with them where we, you know, we would, we would go do hikes and things like that. And that was mm -hmm. the only time the cameras weren't there. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, again, it was an experience. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I'd go back and do it again. And I always say to those people that again, like, Oh, this is, this is so unhealthy. I say again, if this is your, are, are there better ways of doing it? Absolutely. But when you're, if you gave those contestants looking back, if you said, Hey, you can not go on the show or you can do it again, would they do it again? I think they would just yeah. because of what they learned from it. Like, again, it was, we talked, we would sit down and my big thing was like, I want to tell them how to lose weight. Like I want to, let's talk about macronutrients. Like yeah. they're, they're, they're sitting here. And I remember one contestant, they actually had in-house people that lived with them to make sure that they were eating enough. So it was like, okay. you have to drink when you weigh in, you can't be dehydrated. Um, Very got different from that, early days. Yeah, yes. That, that mm -hmm. became a strategy. Yes. It? There was all these gaming. They, they, they would like yeah. game the Whole system. Cold water, yeah. drop water. Or uh, yeah, like even diuretics, wow. I think was one of the things I, I can't say for sure that one of the earlier trainers had done was, you know, like if you take mm. this, you'll. Oh, wow. And so there was there was none of that that went on this time. And again, like. I, I I felt like at the end of the day, it was it was something that they did get healthier on. Is there an incentive for you guys to win? Not like, at all. So it's no. just straight and, up. And my my guy didn't win. Her the the guy that won uh, was on the other team. But I think after a while, there's no teams like on our our season. So there is no. There's like it doesn't matter. You got paid the same regardless yeah, if yeah. they win or lose. No like that. incentive. Obviously, the winner, the person who won, they got. I don't know. It wasn't money. I think it was, uh, you know treadmills from planet fitness and things like that and i just yeah i just remember thinking um yeah that there would probably be more of a prize for mm. winning but. are you are you at a point now where you're because you were you know you have all this popularity lots of young men following you for the bodybuilding type stuff then mm. you do biggest loser different demographic yep. more maybe middle-aged women we'll call watching. it the more the facebook crowd than there you the Instagram go crowd. there you go now mm. are you looking at are you at a place where you feel like okay like where am i going to go with this am i going to rebrand am i going to talk more about these other things that seem more interesting yeah. to me or take this in a are you at, finding yourself in that space definitely and at, at the same time i kind of found my space my myself in that space it was also right around the same time covid hit mm. my wife who's not my wife at the time she was in australia kind of didn't see each other for 10 months. Then we ended up just being like, hey, Australia wasn't going to let her out. She had to have a reason to leave the country. We both were with Gymshark. So she was able to finally get out of the country. We, we met in Dubai and the only, she couldn't come into the US. I couldn't get into Australia. So we just, we traveled for eight months. And that was- So that you could meet up. Yeah. Wow. So we, went, we did Dubai, Maldives, Spain, and we took a videographer so we could still create content, good and bad, like once in a lifetime opportunity, not great for business. It was, you know, I had my business partner on the app that I was still doing content for, but you weren't doing any meetups, obviously, with COVID. That was a big part of, I felt like, um, the things I enjoyed, that interaction, that human connection, uh, you didn't have that. And then also, I think it was just one of those things that kind of, you felt the world kind of, you know, mm, very polarized. Oh, yeah. yeah. More than ever. My yeah. entire life, I feel we're more divided today than yeah. I ever have. And that was hard for me. Again, it was like, it was kind of like, you know, at the, at the kitchen table, I can get on Twitter and I can debate. Like Jordan, LeBron, you get me yeah. on started on that and I'll, and I'll go back and forth. I think it's hard though because I can no emotional connection to it. Like at the dinner yeah. table growing up, 
we're we're all just arguing the other side for the sake of argument. On Twitter, people get so yeah. offended. It's their identity. Yeah. It's their identity and their, their religion, which is kind of weird. Yeah. So that was kind of, and I think that was a moment for a lot of people like that. We're like, well, let me examine my life. Where am I going with this? What do I want to do? Mm. Did you? What did you come out out of that with? I think, so two things. There was, our, with, with fitness culture, coming back to working with people like the guy we just worked with, getting back to doing some hands-on stuff. Because I mm. think- if you don't use it, you'll lose it type mm -hmm. of a thing. So getting back to the nuts and bolts of training rather than just traveling the world, getting very surface level stuff, I think actually getting hands dirty again, going back, educating. So I've thought about going back to school. We want to have a family. We've just settled down in, in St. George, Utah. And I think really getting very upfront and kind of uh, the nitty gritty on as I get older, what does TRT look like? What does actual health look like? What am I going through that I can then just be open and talk to people about um, whether it's training, whether it's, um, you know, mental health and things like that. So we have the app um, supplements. We actually, I launched a supplement brand during okay. COVID and it was, <laughs> was bad. Great. Yeah. Bad time <laughs> to launch. So, Cause again, we, there was zero meetups and also I was traveling for eight months. Didn't try getting supplements in the Maldives. Not going to happen. So um, kind of a, interesting time with what, what do I want to do with that? If I, if I'm passionate enough to go just really, really deep into the supplement world, um, because I do feel like a lot of supplements out there right now are, it's not, it's not like we used to have four big supplement or yeah. five yeah. big supplement brands. There's, you know, there's enough out there that is like how different or how great mm -hmm. of products are you, are you able to do if basically everyone's using the same sourcing. Well, especially since you, I know you, I've heard you talk about before, you're kind of like how we are with supplements, which is there's like a core four things yeah. that are like, yep. you know, all the other stuff is bullshit. Right. And so if you're not, and that's, and unfortunately where the money is at is in all the bullshit. Right. The you margins are- You cute with pre-workout and things like that. But at the end of the day, people want some caffeine, some kind of focus ingredient. <laughs> yeah. And, and, for, it's a good, and, feel and for a good price. Right. Yeah. So yeah, and tastes good, right? Have you thought about doing um, long form media? Because uh, talking to you, and when I do hear you get a little deeper, you're smart. You're a smart dude. And a lot of I don't want to, you know, it's going to sound like an asshole. A lot of I don't know the fitness, you know, We're a little types light. Are, not so much. Yeah. They look good, uh, but kind of light in the in the intelligence department, yeah. the communication department. Have you thought about long form? I feel like I have a little bit of an imposter syndrome. I'm always like, I don't know enough. I'm always kind of like. I don't want to just get out there and, and talk about things because I see guys, whether it's Huberman or whoever, that are experts on these fields. And I think I'm, I've always kind of been that a little bit too much of a perfectionist. Like I didn't want to turn something in that wasn't great. Mm -hmm. Like, But at the same time, it's like you just have to kind of jump in and start swimming and, and figure out where that takes you. So I've thought about it. I, I think that whether it's sports or health stuff, I, I feel like there's always – there's always going to be a reason not to, but I would love, I think, eventually to do a podcast where I live in St. George. It's not the easiest place to get in out of, but Vegas is only two hours away. So I was like, mm. oh, podcast in Vegas or, and I don't even like to to do some, I just, I love the idea of being bad at something and then getting, getting good at well, it. Well, let me ask you this, Steve, mm -hmm. do you have strong opinions? Very. Yeah. Podcast. <laughs> this podcast. is where you do it. This is where sure. you do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I feel like this is your space. That's yeah. probably that's it. probably where his hesitancy is. Definitely not. Yeah, Twitter. I know. I'm like, let's yeah. be honest. Get and that probably leads to like, you know, brands that you work with and yeah. stuff. It's aligning yourself with people that aren't going to be, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, during COVID, I did some deep dive into, I just remember everyone was posting black squares and I'm like, oh, I want to be a part of this. Like racism is bad. We need to get on top of that. But then as I started researching a little bit more into Black Lives Matter, the organization. Yeah, the Marxist organization. Totally a different thing. <laughs> right. And people, I think early on when I like I remember my sister who were not probably aligned on the political spectrum, I was like, you know, go check out their website. She's like, it's an action it's not an organization, Steve. It's just a movement. I'm like, no, you're wrong. Like so many people didn't realize that. Yeah. And so I, I think that again, we get caught up in headlines and clickbait. You know, mm -hmm. getting back to YouTube, that's all the news is these days. Is what, what's the most? You know, clickbait? we got heat for not po posting black squares initially, but I think that you know, if you if you believe and you stick to your your guns and you have integrity, uh, eventually that stuff all comes around. You know, so yeah, we, we, we now it seems obvious when you see the, the reports of the you know the leaders of the Isn't it you weird? know coming out with just yeah. they spent money on crazy yep. stuff and they it was basically just a big. By the organization, yes, the big money. The organization. And, that's, and taking advantage yeah, of people who want to do the right thing. Definitely taking advantage. So much of that. And that's where I like Tony Dungy. I'm a huge fan of Tony Dungy, read his books. And like, so when I, there's people in that community, in the black community that I would definitely try to like 
I want to listen to and hear. I, I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not African American. I don't know what it's like, but hearing them, hearing people that I, I follow, and I have my beliefs in in terms, of, I would say, like even religion and and how conservative I am. I, you know, I wouldn't say I'm right wing. I'm more in the middle. I feel like, but to a lot of people, it probably would see like, oh, you're a, you're you know, you're such a Republican. I'm like, I feel like I'm more of a libertarian, but. But it was, again, I would look at people in that space that I looked up to, that I had my kind of my morals that aligned with them. And I would listen to what they were saying on those types of things. I didn't want to just jump into something because everyone else was doing it. Yeah. Do you think um, it's funny because uh, during that whole time during COVID, the insanity, and, and it really was crazy. Um, some of the loudest voices came from the health and fitness space, partially because I think we're, um, uh, you know, we, we take control of our own health. Yeah. You tend to, my, here's my belief. I'd love your opinion on this. Uh, when you work out and you train, you feel more autonomous. It's harder to manipulate you because you're more, you feel more in control. You feel mm. like you have more, you're more empowered. Do you feel like fitness tends to make people have those beliefs that tend to be more libertarian, which is like, Hey, look, respect others, but also respect me. Yeah. Let me do my thing. I'll let you do your thing. Just don't hurt anybody. Don't steal from anybody. I, I definitely, even in the fitness community saw kind of a, it was polarizing even in the fitness yeah. community. The majority of people I think kind of were more of the stance that you have like, Hey, I'm going to do my own research. You have to convince me because I am the person that I like to know what I'm taking in my supplement ingredients or the food I'm putting in my body. I know exactly the, like, Hey, when you say hydrogenated oil on that label, or when you say modified cornstarch, that's not good for me. You're trying to sneak it in there. I'm not believing you. Same thing kind of goes with, with, with vaccines and things like, Hey, Show me, show me that where this is healthy. But then you also, I think you had some people that I really looked up to in the space that were scientific. They were totally just jumping into it. Like, oh no, it, medically it's fine. And things like that. I'm like, how do you know that? And you were citing sources that were funded by people that mm -hmm. had no business funding things. And so again, I think it, if, if anything, it just kind of had to take a step back and be like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to agree with everyone on on everything. And these are things that I can debate things, but when it's I'm really passionate about my wife not being able to get into the country or me not being able to get there, all of a sudden it actually, there's, and, and when you do that for, for, you know, a year and a half, there's some frustration, I think, that that ultimately it probably boiled over at some point when I, I you know, I, I think that I wasn't as, level-headed as I, as I could have been, because you're never going to change anyone's opinion by yelling at them with something. But I, I, I definitely thought, I kind of sat back and thought, hmm, it's interesting that that person who's talked about scientific mm -hmm. data all the time has this stance on. Weird. Yeah. Very, very strange. How did you meet your wife, by the way? At a Gymshark event. So oh, yeah, okay. we were in Sydney at a Gymshark event. Wow. So, yeah. and so now you've been married for a year? Been married for yeah, a year yesterday. So congratulations. Before, yeah. And Thanks. you want a big family? We want like two kids. Okay. So yeah, she's, she's younger. <laughs> yeah. I'm 38. She's 26, which I get. Oh, you can out. have way more than two then. Yeah, I know, but I, I'm going to be that six year old dad at <laughs> football practice, good. soccer practice. Hey man, I just hey, had hey, a kid. Hey, at 44. Hey, that's right. She yeah. kept that I'm 41 and yeah. mine's young. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. uh, I actually, I think it's way, way it's better to be, an older way dad. better yeah. to be. And I, that's not to knock on any young dads yeah. out there and stuff like that. But imagine, imagine when you were 25 as dad. Yeah. How like, you know, we don't really mature very quickly as, as men. Let's be honest. Yeah. Yeah, your level of maturity, your level of financial security, yeah. your calmness. Like, yeah. I mean, just there's a, a whole host of things. That, that make you patience mean. factor, I feel like is something Huge. that, yeah, I, my trigger is a lot longer than it was when I was 25 in terms of just the frustration, like that. Yeah, definitely a, a longer fuse. Are you guys aligned on how you'd want to raise your kids, like with school? I think for the most part, okay. like the crazy thing about Australia is, you know, when we look at it, 26 million people, it's the size of the U.S. roughly in terms of land. But Australia, it's always, you know, I might get crap for saying this. Australia thinks they're super diverse and stuff, and they're not. They're like, they don't have the problems the U.S. has because I feel like most of Australia um, is pretty much a, a single demographic. But I think the big thing that they have there is everyone feels like they're Australian. Hmm. It's like, hey, do this for the betterment of your other, your fellow Australian. Hmm. During COVID that happened, there was never like, they don't talk about politics over there. I think their quality of life is pretty good. They get up earliest out of any country in the world or one of, and they go to bed earliest out of any country. And that know. might be where they're situated oh, in the world. That's an interesting stat. I didn't know that. Yeah, it, it is. And I, and I think like Morgan, she goes to bed like nine, 
Her parents are 8.30. It's just wild that the average person goes to bed. Now, let I, me speculate. Let's see. Can you, do you have any speculations on that? I ha- None. So I, I do. I have a speculate. My theory on that would be there's much more of an outdoorsy lifestyle yep. there oh, well, and there the natural Ooh. circadian rhythm of getting out in the sun yep. and then it coming down. Uh, that's, and, a good, that's a good call. I have. There's two. I, that's, that's, that's one half of it is that the sun's up at 4.30 there. Even in the summertime, the latest the sun sets about 7.00. So like it's they're they're a little bit different, mm-hmm. you know, with with their circadian rhythms. The other thing is, I think that because business wise, the U.S. is midday by the time they wake up for business oh, purposes, they're up earlier to get, I guess, their work day going. Mm. But everything closes there at about five p.m. Really? Wow. Every like there's wow, I and, and you don't have the level of you have like McDonald's, KFC. Hungry Jack's, which is, you know, Burger King. And then you have a, like a Guzman and Gomez, which is kind of a Chipotle style thing. Other than that, there's not endless fast food. Like most people go home and cook dinner there. And I feel like if you're going to bed earlier, you're getting outside, you're getting into the ocean yeah. and you're cooking your own food. Those are kind of like the three things that if you can do that, you're yeah. going to be pretty healthy. Those are big like. rocks. Do they ra- yeah. I mean, where do they rank as far as health? Do you know where that is? I don't know. Do you I, know? I would imagine top, top 10. I think yeah. out of the Western nations are probably yeah. one of the better ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You Finland's got, you the happiest place in the world. And I'm like, I got to go to Finland because I can't imagine being cold and dark I think also like the highest percentage of people are antidepressants. Maybe Doug can look that up, which is kind of weird. So, is, is Australia? No, Finland. Oh, Finland. Yeah. That is wild. Happiest, but also highest on, I think. I oh, might that be is totally like a wrong. Scandinavian country mm. thing. Norway has the same thing. Maybe that's what, maybe it's yeah. one of the other countries. So, uh, Which is super interesting, but it's also, <laughs> they're just not getting any vitamin D. They're not getting any yeah. sunlight. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. But Australia is definitely like, for the most part, they still have obesity, you know, like they still have their own issues, but there's this, there's a lot of resources in terms of, it's, it's like California in the 1950s is kind of what I imagine it yeah. to be like, is where there's beaches you know it's pretty lush you know for the most part it's 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 good climate people are outside doing things but you don't have traffic crime and mm. you know some other a large fitness culture there massive yeah I and bodybuilding say. culture large bodybuilding large fitness and you look at it summer games wise australia has more medalists than any other country per capita yeah so they do well in their sports that again they just don't have a ton of people that's right why not live there we yeah. will eventually. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. okay. We will eventually. There's some things that I struggle with. It. It's not why we're not Is there it the now. The big spiders that we talked about. <laughs> <earlier>? <laughs> Fortunately, Spider Morgan snakes and crocs. Like, <sighs> Morgan didn't have like air conditioning or heat in her house until like the last house she rented. It was just wild to me. It was what? Just like, I know. It's just like I went there the first the first uh, time I visited and stayed at her her house. It's like 80, we were sleeping, it was like 85 degrees. Oh God. And she was fine in it. I'm like, what the hell? Yeah. I'm like, I'm not sleeping in 85 and it's humid. It's like, no. you know, no thanks. But I think, you know, I, I like the fact that, um, kind of weird, and I always say this to her, because it was a penal colony, I feel like there's always been a group of people in Australia that have kind of controlled everyone else. <laughs> but like, and that sounds super off. I'm going to get some serious hate for that. But I feel like there's a lot of this like, hey, do this, do this, do this. And everyone in Australia is like, yeah, sounds good to me. Okay, let's do that. Yeah. But um, it, it is interesting. I, I did, I read some books on how Australia was started and it, 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 you know, it is kind of also like survival of the fittest. Like you had the the fastest, probably, you know, there's some evolutionary stuff to why I think people are, are you know, they are who they are as a people in Australia just from tough Tough sledding. To one of our there. one of our largest audiences uh, mm-hmm. outside the U.S. is Australia. Yeah, yeah. I'd say love it. I'd say either there or the U.K. Very close. Yeah, uh, yeah. Tie. yeah so. Australia. You guys never been? No, no. I guys, haven't. But always, yeah. Always wanted to go. Now that yeah. I mean, they don't. It was weird. COVID. They're just like yeah. gone. Like in terms of, they had all these rules and regulations. And then, well, they no had some of the hardest, had, strictest, yes. harsh. And yeah. I think that they had a big switch because people had enough, because they were just locked down for yeah. a while in some places. Melbourne was the most locked down city in the world, I was told. Sydney was. was and your wife was there during that time? So, she, what happened with her? Yeah, she was. So, she was in Brisbane, which wasn't as bad, but they okay. had like sections, like it'd be like Oregon and California. Oregon, like everything's open, California's not. Or, right. Or, you know, Nevada and California. In her state, people from. New South Wales couldn't come in. Like they, they kind of were like blocked off state by state, and each state had different rules, and wasn't letting in people from the other state in. So hmm. kind of weird. But Brisbane uh, didn't have it. Like the people there were never locked down in like their homes. Um, I, I know, like my friends in Sydney, like they couldn't go more than five kilometers from their house. 
Like oh. really weird, really weird. When we start like again from a fitness aspect, what are what are things that are going to be just a health hazard? Yeah. Right, like health. get out in the sun, move. Right. Don't uh, you, you stay Total inside. Contradiction. Just, yeah. yeah, weird. Yeah, I'm seeing now studies that are coming out now that are um, showing that the there was more harm than good in when you count uh, excess deaths, uh, mental illness. Yeah, um, and then displacement of people who are you know it, it, disenfranchised. So when you count all that, so you might have reduced infection, although the data is showing that probably not. But you might have. But excess deaths were higher anyway because of all this other stuff that happened and the harsher the the policy is the worse right the outcome and and to that point i feel like so much of health is community so much of like you know when you look at centurions like people that live over 100 years old yes. you have these blue zones in like italy I think there's one in there's Okinawa Loma. Sardinia yeah. the seventh so day Loma Linda. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Loma Linda yeah and there and then it's like that just went away during COVID. You had grandma who was probably used to seeing her whole family. Now she's locked down in a nursing care facility. What was her life expectancy? Steve, that, that was time? my, so my, to my grandparents were very close family. So I have a lot, we're, we're family of immigrants and we're Italian. And my grandparents, we were always there. My, their, their kids were there, their grandkids were there. And then when this all happened, everybody was scared. And so we isolated ourselves from them for, I want to say four or five months mm. before we were like, this is not working anymore. But in that four or five month period, I saw my grandparents age like seven. It looked like seven years. Like I remember when I went to go see them. It's like, oh, they don't look good. Like yeah. they, their health declined so quickly in that short period of time. And yeah. it was 100% because, I mean, we were bringing them food and dropping it off the door yep. and we were FaceTiming them. But yeah. it's not. It's well, what's not the, the study? Same. What's the study that you shared last year? What was the the compared it to smoking cigarettes? Your rela yeah. relationship uh, health? Yeah, or relationships like smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I my grandma passed away during covid again she she wasn't great but morgan's grandma did as well again people that they had other issues she didn't pass away from covid but it was that idea like well, we she didn't see people she mm -hmm. didn't see her friends like how much does that play and you really you can't calculate that like oh, well they okay. have no they can the, they data's, can. Clear. the okay. data is very clear on it they'll show you uh on the data that loneliness is a but i'm saying like indicator. how how do they know my grandma, your grandma, oh, people no. like, yeah, they they have no way of calculating those deaths because they're going to chalk them up to, you know, like my grandma Old had, age or something had a like stroke that. or, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But again, a lot of that's compounded by the fact that totally. you're alone. Totally. I felt like I aged five years during COVID, just the amount of stress and worry we went through trying to get Morgan into the country. She was detained in the U.S. actually. Why? Sent back. So when she got out of Australia um, the first time in November of 2020, the, on one of the stipulations on her getting out was that she wasn't going to come back for X four months or something. Like she had to be gone for at least three months when she got to the U S and she didn't have a return flight. They're like, why are you here? Oh, my, my, my boyfriend's here. So they were like, Oh, you're under the wrong visa. You need a fiance visa. Like you're, you're here as an ESTA. You can't do that. You're, you're a high risk of staying here and, and not going back to your country. So she was detained, never allowed in for 14 hours, like phone taken from her, Whoa. Uh, put back on a flight, and then she had a quarantine. So each time she went back to Australia, she came the first time, and we spent like three three months in the U.S. She went back, quarantined for 14 days, and this is in a hotel room. 14? 14 days, yeah. No no outside air. Like it was just just a room like this, a hotel room. Um, so she had to do that. Three three different times in Australia, Ugh, and I'm just man. like I I'm like I think about that, and that's probably why I think our relationship um, really like I never I never was a guy that that cried or got emotional about like my partner when I would talk about him, but going through those kind of traumatic things, like when we eventually got married, like I was a mess just because I think you know doing that kind of stuff when someone gets detained and you don't know where they're at, like I was trying I was calling figure, trying to figure out where they're at, and she's just in. You know, immigrant prison essentially. It's it's weird. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. That, that'd have been scary as shit, yeah. dude. Do you find yourself now your your views of health and fitness uh, it being more complete, and more evolved than the way they used to? You're mentioning now loneliness yep. and, and relation. You know, relationships. Like I didn't know that was important in my right. 20s. Yeah, definitely more empathetic. I think for people that um, have mental health stuff you know, mental health, whether it's depression or things like that. And then also probably just more, more overall kind of like, Hey, you're not going to be, and I, it, when you're young and when you're fit and you think this is how it's going to be forever, you don't ever have any of these, you know, I think that was kind of a wake up call for all of us in COVID. Like, 
life as, as kind of how you had it or you thought it would be, it can change like that. And so it's like that appreciation. And I think, you know, when, when someone dies, mm -hmm. you, you get that feeling for, you know, a couple of weeks. I think I try to hold on to that with COVID, just thinking about the feelings and everything that you went through um, when you didn't have, you know, just the weird day-to-day -day stuff that you would typically have with people. Has your training changed a lot? Um, my training, yeah, definitely. So I have a lower back um, issue that's always been an issue since college football. I remember working out with Thor Bjornsson, strongest oh. man. I got off a plane in Sweden and like we just went over there. It was supposed to be this like light workout. Oh, I ended up like PRing <laughs> back squat. The world's strongest he, man. Yeah, he we did like Atlas Stones and he I just remember he was trying to pump me up and like smacked me on the back <laughs> twice. And like I just thought every like my every cell in my body was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> it was just it was it was a next level, but I couldn't move the neck. I couldn't stand up. Like we went to lunch afterwards oh, and God. I was like, oh, okay, that's that's something that. happened. Yeah, it was just a, a little bulging disc essentially that always happens now like i kind of throw it out and get a little bit of like nerve damage onto this right side um so i like i flex this leg and i can see it other people can't that's not quite the same so it's always battling with that i've had a couple of shots in it so now i think i focus a lot more on mobility um stability and mobility and being strong in, in certain areas like again my my back shouldn't move if my hips and, and glutes can do the work um my lower back should be and, and mm -hmm. it used to be opposite. I was moving my back too much, but I think that my, my training is definitely less like balls to the wall, like on a leg day, just push through pain type of a thing. And, and now it's, I would say like, Hey, getting into the gym and even less, less total number of sets, but quality of, of things. I always look at a clock when I train, I, I don't like just sitting in there and bull crapping in between sessions. So, um, and then I probably train four days, maybe five, you know, I have a, a day that I can kind of go in and, and accessory body parts if I want, but more so the mobility. Have you ever felt like rebelling and kind of shutting it all down for a while, like going off social, yeah. not working out for a while? And I just... kind of felt like I did that a little bit in the last, you know, a couple, like I, I really didn't post if I didn't feel like posting. Yeah. And like, again, if it wasn't fun, I wasn't going to post it. And I think, again, this is, I, I, I just became kind of, didn't 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 give a shit for lack of better words. It was yeah. just one of those things. I was like, I, I don't care if I'm going to get some heat from sponsors or whatnot. I'm like, I I need this kind of a reset type thing. Yeah. And and also then not. I, I used to probably get a euphoric feeling when, oh my gosh, that just became my most liked post yeah. five six years ago. Quickly realized how toxic that is to put kind of your self worth um, based upon if your self worth is based upon how many followers you have and things like that. So I kind of just luckily having a big family, they keep you in check. Nobody else in my family cares about social media. They're all teachers <laughs> or, you know, nurses and real deal jobs. And I, I remember early on people were like, you do what? And you're able to make a living off of it. <laughs> like it was always just kind of this weird, like what's, what's Steve do? Yeah. Um. So I, I kind of, I get back to like, at the end of the day, I have no, I have no problem not posting yeah, and, yeah. and just being like, yep. What is the most uh, profitable revenue stream for you? Is it the app? Our app, yeah. The Our app. fitness app. Is Tell definitely. me a bit, because so a little Explain bit of back. Yep. Justin and I, before Mind Pump ever started, we were building an app together and ended up scratching that when Mind Pump took off bigger yep. and we burned a ton of money trying to build it. Yep. Tell me about your journey on that. I want to know, one, how you how you chose or decided to get a partnership with yep. somebody because you're such, you're such the face of the brand. And so if you've got some sort of a split with somebody yep. that nobody really knows, so I want to know about that. And then just the whole startup of it, how much it costs to build something like yep. that, how long it took to be profitable. And that's, that's so I, I had my own web website, like Steve Cook Health. Do you remember gregplitt.com? Yep. Yeah. That was kind of like the gold standard for me. I'm like, oh, I want to have my own website. And then all of a sudden that became Became more app focused, I think. So I had a I had a website where I you know I'd get on we we uh, I, I would have weekly conversations before like Skype was ever a thing. We'd get on um, and we would go over people's trainings, go over nutrition, and um, there was a never I never did any like hey eat this this and this and this. It was more just like a open forum questions, and then we would do um, we would talk about training questions and things like that. I didn't even tell people what, cause I had programs on bodybuilding.com. So we didn't even actually, it was a breach of contract. If I would have had my own stuff at that time, it wasn't until the app where then my business partner, Jacob Hutton, he, he was a guy that he was doing CrossFit stuff. So he, 
I think he was, I don't know if he ever did his thesis, but studying to get his master's, was an assistant strength coach at a college in Utah. We played high school football together. He played college football. Absolute beast. He was a CrossFit guy, but also had a bodybuilding slash athletic background. Um, so knew, knew his stuff. Knowledgeable. Had, yeah, had all sorts of different certs. Again, was a kinesiology uh, sports science guy. And so um, we started doing some programming. He would kind of write the meat and potatoes of a strength phase. I would add, okay, I want I want the split to look like this, or I want to add this exercise. Kind of put my spin on it, making sure it was, um, I don't want to say bodybuilding focused, but more something that was true to my training. Yeah. Um, and so our thing was always kind of like, you know, you want to, you want to. You don't want to be an ornament. You want to. You don't want to just look good. Yeah. You want to look good, but you also want to be able to perform. Yeah. Being an athlete growing up, I think that that was always. I, I I stayed it longer than our football fitness class because I wanted to train some beach muscles. But that was always after the fact of making sure you do your power cleans. Yeah. Your you know your if it's we never did hang snatch, but your front squats, your back squats, following that true like we did in like Nebraska strength training at our high school was mm. the low like five sets of five and things like that. And so I think that it was always like, Hey, we can't just be getting, you know, and Jake was the same way we aligned on our goals. It was look good, but always be getting stronger or always be following your goal, whether it's a power phase, whether it's a strength phase. Yeah. Um, and then also getting lean. We do, we have a program that is more, I would say supersets, but also more diet focused on, 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 leaning out as well. So when you guys first get together, how does that conversation go? You already have got a lot of attraction yep. and fame and, and stuff. You bring someone in who really doesn't bring that table. Well, of course, he's got the knowledge. Yep. Did you right out the gate say, hey, whatever we're going to build together is going to be 50-50? Like, how did you decide? Yeah, and I, I think I probably always, again, getting back to, I always probably underestimate myself and overestimate other people, what they're, what they're bringing to things. And I think that that's probably, whether it's companies I've worked with or potential partnerships, I think, again, I, I want people to succeed because I want them to feel excited about things. So I was like, hey, you know, you're you're doing some programming for a CrossFit gym right now. Like, you know, let's create this together type of a thing. You know, I really valued, I still do value him for, for what he knows with the strength and, and conditioning side of things. But ultimately, I think that it kind of got me doing less of what I was good at as well, where it's like, again, when you get back into training people, when you get back into the things that, you know, you got to started doing originally, yeah. it like, keeps you sharp. Yeah. Um, if you're not doing those things, you kind of just lose it. Did you so. guys split the investment to build it too? Or yep. was that, so well, yeah. it, there really wasn't a ton of invest. We kind of, we, we kind of actually started off um, with some challenge stuff. And then as it grew, things kind of got a little bit weird business wise. He had another company that he was doing some gym software stuff for. So we're kind of still in the middle of, of, of working through all of that kind of stuff. And I will say on the business side of things, I think, you know, again, we get along because we're kind of like, like you guys, mutual respect goes a long way. I know, you know what you're talking about. Let me do what I'm good at. I'll respect you and, and, and trust you to let you do what you're good at. And then let's come in and, and talk about where we align on core values and things like that. So, and so the app's now profitable and doing, yeah, the app is, is definitely, you know, we have a, we have a gym that like for the first five years, we're like, if we can just break even on this, we're, we're going to mm. be happy because it's a place where we can film all of our stuff. Now we're, you know, we're profitable in the gym. Oh, where's the gym at? It's in St. George. Oh, cool. Yeah, same spot. So again, it's, it's, you know, we have like 400 members, but it's 11,000 square feet and you know, it's, it's, totally different crowd than when I was training at Gold's Gym Venice, like living in LA. I just, I, I, I can't get worlds, more worlds apart than St. George in mm. LA. And I kind of like that pace. Of I was life, just going to say like, how is a guy like you growing up, you know, Utah, big family, yeah. all that. And then you go live in LA. Like, what was it like living in LA? Every day I was like, why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> every, every day I was like, is this worth it? Is this worth it? And it's, it's funny. I, I think it was just like, Again, I, I stuck it out way longer because people are like, oh, no, after a year, you'll like it. I never liked L.A. And I think, again, now I'm like, if you like L.A. and you're not from California, I think you're weird. <laughs> There's people that do. L.A. is always tough for me when I yeah. land and I walk yeah. around and go. And it's like, oh, yeah, no, it's Orange nice. County, like San Diego, like, yeah. you know, like there's parts of California I love. But L.A., mm -hmm. for whatever reason, I just. It feels like everybody's waiting to get discovered or yeah. something. I don't know. Yeah. It just feels like you're walking around Instagram yeah. land. Yeah. 
It feels very, very strange. And Gold's Gym was kind of the heart of that. There oh. were so many like crushed dreams. I, I thought I was going to be the next Arnold, but I'm living in my van outside. And yeah. I was just like, ooh. I, I remember like before OnlyFans was the thing, you had like the, the gay for pay. Yeah. Oh. And that was massive in that Gold's Gym. And you just had, a, I think, Muscle a lot of- Muscle worship, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. So I remember being approached by- like my first week there in the parking lot, someone was like, hey, do you need another sponsor? They rolled up in their car. Like, do you need another sponsor? <laughs> um, and, they're, and I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, I have, I have bodybuilding.com. They're like, well, you know, super discreet, but yeah. and I was just like, no, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. But I was like, I've often been like, if you're, you know, so-and-so from Missouri moved out there, yeah, you have no money. It's like, yeah. you can see why, again, people can take advantage of. Yeah. There's that yeah. dark cloud of LA code. where it feels yeah. like, yeah. yeah. I didn't even know that was a thing until I got into competing. That was, no, I didn't either. I thought it was like a joke that yeah. someone was really doing, like someone was fucking with me. I was like, Oh, this is like a thing. Like yeah. people actually. <laughs> and it's, it's crazy actually how long it's been going on. Yeah. Like, and then what was a killer Sally? Did oh, you guys yeah, watch yeah. that? Oh yeah. Great documentary. I had a hard time watching it. Oh, yeah. It was so, it, it hit Too close home to gold's Jim Venice. I was like, I know these, these people, I mean, not those people, like, but people like yeah. that. And it was just like, it's such a sad industry when you get into that hardcore competing world where yeah, you're yeah. spending so much money to compete and not getting anything out of yeah. it. Yeah. What, what, what would you say, Steve, is the most misunderstood thing about you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, misunderstood. I don't know. I, I think probably, uh, have you guys seen, what is it? Blue, blue collar. No, what is it with Thad Castle? Mm. You remember what, what is that? Blue Mountain State. That, okay. that TV show. You guys ever seen that? No, no, no. no. Well, there's that that jock football player guy that's on there. It's just a d bag. And I feel like people sometimes when they'd actually meet me, like you're way different than I thought you'd be. I thought you'd be a douchebag. I thought you'd be a douchebag. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, well, I think it's probably because I have a bunch of brothers and sisters that if I wasn't being a douchebag, and there was plenty of times I was being a douchebag, they would tell me. Uh, yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. That, oh, there he is. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's sad. If you watch it, I love his character in it because he's just that quintessential <laughs> jock that's just the meathead who's an a hole. Yeah. But that, like, you know, I played linebacker. He's a linebacker, and like, I, so I always imagine people see me as Thad Castle. Okay, uh, another another deep question. So we uh, we always talk about uh, most of us that are in the fitness space that become very passionate about it. Most of us were driven to the gym by some sort of insecurities. Do you think that that has a lot to do with? I know you have the athletic background, but do you think you have wrestled with a lot of uh, insecurities that drove you into the gym? It's interesting because I think off the top of my head, I would say no. It was it was my dad. Like it was a way to kind of bond with my dad mm -hmm. because we didn't. He was kind of that hard, hard ass dad, that military type dad that when I would get a good job, it was probably because of something I did physically. Mm. So I would say that it's an insecurity. Sure. Um, but it's probably, so not a body one. Yeah. More like an approval. Yeah. Mm. Probably more of an approval. Like that was, that was me making, making my dad happy to do like, Oh, I remember when I was a kid, he'd be like, Oh, you know, before I'd run my hundred meter, he'd be like, Bo Jackson at your age would probably do this in a minute, <laughs> a minute, a minute and 34. What a standard. I know. Super realistic. Right? Yeah. And, and so, and so like, I just remember that was how I would like try to get his approval. I think. So. Okay. So what are some <laughs> things since we're talking about dads, we're all fathers in here. Uh, what are some things that you would take from your dad that when you're a father, you're like, I, I, I definitely want to make sure I emulate that. And what are yeah. things are like, I, I'm going to do that different. I think, uh, so, so doing things different, I would say just unconditional love. I think that that's a, a very important thing for a kid to, to know and understand. It's like, no matter what you do, and I think this gets back to almost religious views. No matter what you do, I'm going to love you. Mm -hmm. No matter what you do, like you're always going to be my son or my daughter. There's nothing you can do, but there's things that, that, that you do that disappoint me. Um, because I, I think it's not being your, your best self, like approaching it from that love first. Like, mm -hmm. Hey, I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to break my dad's trust, not because I'm scared I'm going to get an ass whooping, but mm. because I don't want to see the hurt that that causes him. I didn't have that as a kid. It was like, I'm Fear. scared I'm going to get the ass whooping. <laughs> and I think that that does go, you know, you have to have consequences because in life, if you don't teach your kids that there's consequences for actions, they're, it's going to be They're going to learn it at some point. Yeah, it's going to be a rude awakening. Um, and then I think the, the other thing that I think that I, you know, I love that my dad, he was open for we had a lot of hard discussions, but, and it was almost kind of like doom and gloom sometimes. I think he got that from his parents, but, um, how to work hard, save money, doing the things like, Hey, as a dad, I need to make sure that, you know, you, you know, 
a ha- yeah how to work hard how to how to make sure that you don't quit on things same as sports like kind of those same sports lessons uh, and then i think ultimately you know family like it was like god family and then yeah and that that kind of order so i think mm. that he he also probably i never saw my dad go out and party go out like he never was a boy's boy like he was never like a man's man hanging out with buddies after work through like he was always coming home to my mom treating my stepmom really well and i think that that you know they had a good relationship that i think that i could build off of yeah it's funny how that that seems like that's different i think that's what our culture has been the last we talk about the peter pan syndrome and that we celebrate the dads that are the bros that are going out and doing yeah. it but it's like that's what makes a good dad. To yeah. me. The dad that comes home, that's around, that's a, becomes a family man when he's like that. What about your relationship with money? You come from kind of a blue collar background, and then you have your rise to fame and money. Like, how's that journey been? Did you were, did you get a windfall at one time, and then did you blow a lot? Like, have you been I, conservative with your money? I have one item that I regret buying, and it was a Louis Vuitton duffel bag. Wow! And I bought it like in Spain. It was kind of like you know, you're. I think my buddy Sean Stafford was buying something for his wife and I was single at the time. And like, I bought this bag and every time I see it now, I've never like, I've never used it. Really? And yeah. It's just one of those things. Like I'm so cheap. I'm so frugal. Like Morgan, she's not, she's not a spender either, but she's the spender out of us. And I think it's bad. Cause it's, it's also one of those things that where it's like, I, I don't like paying full price for anything. I'm just like, it's weird. It's like, <laughs> and so it's, it's almost a bad thing. It's like, Hey man, enjoy yourself. Do that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I think like, I, yeah, I know what it's like to work at Texas Roadhouse. I never, I, I, I always want to make sure that I, you know, like I'll even do stupid brand deals where it's like, just pay for that rather than like, if it's a brand that I like, I remember I did a protein cereal brand deal. I like the protein cereal, but it was like, I, I, I wanted to try it. So I was just like, Hey, do you guys want to do a, a brand deal? And they're like, yeah, we'd love to. And they paid me money for it, but it was just cause I wanted to try it. That yeah. I was like, I'm not going to buy this. I'm not going to buy this. I'm going to reach out and, and see if they want to do a brand deal. So it was actually pretty good. Do you find, do you find now, uh, as an, you know, as an adult, uh, that you, because of your relationship with your dad, that you feel like you have to, uh, earn somebody's love uh, constantly? Do you find yourself in that place where you're like, I have to be lovable yeah. by doing these things and bringing value? Is that yeah. a challenge? I think I think that is a, a massive challenge. The the people pleasing, just kind of mm-hmm. even saying yes to things. Like this is probably five, six years ago, you know, saying yes to things that you know you can't do. Um, and I think that that stems from that. Like you just want to make people happy. You want to keep so-and-so, mm-hmm. you know, you don't want to get in trouble. You want to keep dad happy. And, and I think that that's ultimately one of the biggest things I, I, I try to catch myself if I start doing like, Hey, don't, don't do the people pleasing thing. Yeah. So, um, I, there's been somewhat of a movement, uh, that's been kind of anti football for kids talking about mm. it's danger and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that the, the concussion and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, Justin is such an advocate of the, the, the life skills you learn from football. I've heard you now mention sports and yeah. what it taught you. How do you feel about that? Do you think it's uh, that there's more, more positive than negative? I think if taught, right. Like as growing up, I'm sure you're in the same boat. I was told to like put your nose in someone's numbers. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. not the correct way to tackle. <laughs> like who's who's teaching that? We like, did a lot of head tackling. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and that's where I think that I don't think football needs to necessarily be this inherent like no no. I think that if you get behind teaching correct form tackling and things like that, you look at rugby players. They don't have they have shoulder and knee issues mainly shoulder from again they lead mm-hmm. with their shoulder. Um, but we all of a sudden throw in a helmet and think we're invincible. So I'm not going to say I'm not going to let my I'll, I'll let my kids play football, but I won't be devastated if they don't. Mm. Um, and I definitely think sports in general teaches lessons that you really don't learn. Tremendous lessons. Else. Yeah. Yeah. Huge lessons. Have you started thinking more about fatherhood now that you're contemplating having a child soon? Like, I mean, is that? Yeah. I think it's always kind of, you know, you as a kid, you're always like, oh, I'll do this different. I'll do that. But I, I almost look at it as. You know, when I was on The Biggest Loser, I tried, you know, John Wooden is probably all-time greatest basketball coach from UCLA, Mm -hmm. you know, won more college championships than anyone else. I I read one of his books when I was actually doing The Biggest Loser, trying to be a better coach and trying to, you know, not focus so much on the winning and losing. And I think, geez, I could, in Utah, I don't know if it's like this everywhere, but parents focus so much 
at these kids' games on the wins and losses, yelling at the refs and things like that, rather than teaching life lessons to their kids, mm-hmm. rather than focusing on effort, rather than, you know, like all they care about, oh yeah, my kid, you know, won, scored this many touchdowns. But like, you know, so that to me is like, as a parent, I want to be somebody who doesn't focus on external like wins and losses. It's more about, hey, at the end of the day, doors closed, you're in your bed at night. Like, can you say you, you played your hardest or you you were a good teammate or, you know, just whatever that is. I think that's way more important. And on that biggest loser, I tried telling, you know, that process, whether it's a fitness journey, whether it's uh, parenthood, it's like this idea of like, you got to enjoy this, this process. If you just enjoy the outcome, you're going to be let down constantly. Yeah, like yeah. when win or lose some of, like I, like I said earlier, some of my most, low points was walking around LA eating 12 donuts after a show because there was nowhere. Yeah. There was, and there was nowhere for me to get my rush from. It was like that, that happened. I have no goals right now. It was like, it it become, it became such a toxic thing. Yeah, Yeah, totally. Well, Steve, you're a very interesting person. I'm glad we had you on the show, man. It was good to be here. I do think that you were, you're, you're, you should do long form. I think that would be your, your. How long did we run right now? Oh, that was over an hour and a half. Hey, that's pretty good. good. That was almost two hours. Yeah, that was awesome. No, I I appreciate you coming on the show, man. Nice. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. 